that kind uh, introduction out of ours, I'll send you a check later. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, a singular object in mathematics that arose out of a fun, playful puzzle and has managed to find itself in a whole bunch of different areas of discrete mathematics. Now, discrete mathematics, um, combinatorics, the art and science of counting, graph theory, the, you have points and lines that indicate objects and relationships, number theory, algebra, uh, and a whole host of other areas. And this one object, ties a lot of these things together. Now, I got interested in this object. Well, I'll tell you about that later. Uh, so so what, do you, what, what do you expect? Well, the uh, origin of this object uh, came from a question that was asked by a fellow named Thomas Kirkman. Now, he knew the answer already, uh, like a good teacher, or maybe a good lawyer. I don't know. And, um, We'll see another origin in geometry uh, with a man named Gino Fano uh, and a particular uh, projective plane uh, way of arranging points and lines. Then uh, we come to Euler. The, the, the people along the way are so fascinating. Uh, Euler was this genius who uh, sort of rode through mathematics and changed it forever. Uh, he was very prolific. He wrote over 2,100 pages of mathematics in algebra and number theory alone. Uh, just incredible. And he had incredible insight. And what I'm going to talk about is one time when he was consummately, spectacularly wrong. Nice things to happen. <laughs> and then we'll talk about a, a fellow named P.J. Haywood. Haywood is and how he was almost completely right. He made a guess about coloring maps. And his guess was absolutely right, except for one case, which was the famous four color problem, coloring maps in the plane. And then finally, we'll find out what happened when the great computer scientist Richard Hamming got mad at a computer. Have you ever gotten mad at a computer? <laughs> Anybody in this room who has never gotten mad at a computer, hold up your hand. Uh, I didn't think that. Uh, yeah. Give him time. <laughs> Anybody in this room who's over 12 years old? <laughs> 15, 20. <laughs> I get mad at them all the time. But every once in a while, something really good happens. And so Richard Hamming is getting mad. Oh, well, let's get started. This is Sir Thomas, uh, this is uh, the Reverend Thomas P. Kirkman, uh, an English clergyman who, whose first mathematical paper was published when he was 40, who wrote about a lot of areas before anybody else did. Combinatorial designs are ways of organizing objects, grouping objects together in. Uh, to, to achieve certain characteristics, which sounds really vague, but that's about as good as I can do. He wrote about these things. Uh, he uh, invented some of the things that were not named for him. What he's most famous for is something called the Kirkman schoolgirl problem, which involves 15 girls walking to school in five lines of three every day for seven days, and the object is to arrange a schedule of who walks with whom so that everybody walks with everybody else exactly once. He asked that question, but he already knew the answer. Uh, he wrote about some things called quaternions. Uh, he wrote about some things called Hamiltonian paths, which have a very strong connection with uh, optimization. Uh, something called traveling salesman problem, which involves such things as this. Uh, he was way ahead of his time. Uh, and what we're interested in here is, uh, here's this question. Can you find a set of seven items to arrange these into seven three-element subsets, each 
set, which we're calling a block, contains three items. Each item is in three blocks. And each pair of items is in exactly one block together. He asked this in a magazine. And a couple of years later, he published the answer. He says, yeah. <laughs> and he said, you can't. And they said, well, Tom, you ought to publish the, you know, what is it? And then, well, he showed it. So, you know what we're going to do here? We're going to construct it. All right? We've got seven objects, which might as well be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we're going to have one, two, and three together in one block. Now, what happens next is that one and two can't be together again, one and three can't be together again, two and three can't be together again, and one, two, and three each have to be in, set, in three sets. So, there are the sets. There's going to be another one with a one, another one with, yeah. And, and, so now we've got to figure out where four and five go. Well, let's be greedy. Let's put four and five there, six and seven together. If those aren't the numbers, change the names, okay? It's, it's the same thing. Now what happens? What, what's the smallest number that can go with two? Four. four. Yeah, right. Okay, so we'll do that. But a four with a two and a five with a two. Why can't we put the four and the five together? It's right. already there, yeah. Can't you look? Yeah, of course. And also, same thing with three and four. And now, well, what are we going to put uh, here? Six. Okay. And what about the others? Seven and six. You're very good. You figured it out. <coughs> Notice that the way we constructed this pretty much guarantees there's only one arrangement up to changing the names. So, this is the 731 block design. Seven objects arranged in seven clumps of three each. Everybody appears in three and each pair appears exactly once, and I'm going to number those, label those A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Very musical, by the way. Okay. So here's a definition of this strange idea. Uh, a balanced, incomplete block design satisfies all these properties. It's, it's, it's a generalization of what I talked about with 7, 3, and 1. That each Block contains K objects, we call them varieties. Um, the name actually derives from agricultural experiments from the 1920s, uh, where the famous statistician Fisher got involved uh, over in England in setting up a design and statistical design of experiments. So this came out of real applied mathematics, and it also came out of a fun puzzle. Isn't that wonderful? Anyway, uh, if uh, the number of blocks and the number of varieties is the same, this is called a symmetric design. And so one of the things I love about mathematics is the language. And when I learned about this object in graduate school, that this was a symmetric, balanced, incomplete block design, <laughs> something just glowed in science. <laughs> and it's so cool. And David Rosell was my teacher in combinatorics. Uh, who was secretary of the MAA, by the way, for a few years, like 15. Um, he uh, told about some other, other names, other, other disguises in, under which uh, 731 uh, showed up. So, well, let's see. So that's a block design. Now there's another way to describe the 731 design. There's some things called different sets. And a different set with those parameters, the same parameters, by the way, is a, a subset, k element subset of the integers mod n, 0, 1, 2, 3, all, uh, mod v, excuse me, up to v minus 1, such that every non-zero element can be expressed as a difference of elements of d in exactly lambda ways. If you look at 1, 2, and 4. If you look at the differences, what are the differences? Well, there's 1 minus 2, 1 minus 4, and 2 minus 4. And if you take those numbers and uh, reduce them mod 7, divide by, you find the least positive, non positive remainder of those, 1 minus 2 is the same as 6, 1 minus 4 is 4, and 2 minus 4 is 5. So we've got those. 
And if you take the differences in the other order, you get 2 minus 1, which is 1, 4 minus 1, which is 3, and 4 minus 2, which is 2. So we get 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3. Each number exactly once. And that's a difference set. And people study these things. Uh, in fact, there people go absolutely bananas over them. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it kind of gets to you after a while. They try and construct these things. Uh, it turns out that the first five digits in pi, not counting duplication, not the, form a different set in model 11. <laughs> Now, if that isn't magical and mystical, what is? <laughs> no, it's an accident, right? <laughs> it does. Uh, if you take all, all there, there are 20 differences, and each number from 1 through 10 occurs twice. And there's some others there. Well, why am I bothering talking about this? Is there's a way to construct the design using the difference set. You take the difference set, 1, 2, 4, and you offset it. You add 1 to each element. And if you go over 7, you wrap around. And so this is another way. It's a different set construction of the 731 design. So the 731 design is a block design. It's also a different set. So we've got two names so far. We're not stopping at two. Uh, otherwise, this would be a very short talk. Now, I know there are no bad short talks. <laughs> OK. Moving on to Gino Fano. Gino Fano was. An Italian mathematician who got very interested in geometry, and in particular in the axioms, the rules for projective geometry, where you have, you know, in ordinary geometry, every pair of points determines a unique line. Every pair of lines meets, if at all, in, one, in a unique point and various things like that. Well, projective geometry, uh, Every pair of points determines a unique line. Every pair of lines determines a unique point. And Fano was able to draw and construct a seven-point plane where you think of the points as the, uh, the lines as the sets. The set one, two, three, one, four, five, one, six, seven. Across the bottom, two, four, six. This diagonal, two, five, seven. <coughs> 3, 4, 7, the other diagonal, and 3, 5, 6, the circle. You have to use your imagination to think of those as the lines. Well, those are exactly the blocks of the 7, 3, 1 block design. And this is called a Fano plane. It's a projective plane of order n equals 2. They are of various orders. Are they of every order? Nobody knows. What is known is that there are uh, points, or there are planes of order n. This construction can be mimicked uh, if n is uh, a prime number or a power of a prime number. It's also known that there are no such things of order two, uh, of, of, of order uh, one, and there are no such things of order six, and that there are no such things of order ten, and nobody knows. Big unsolved problem. Solve that problem. Find necessary and sufficient conditions for constructing one of these people. And you will be rich and famous. <laughs> and when you do, please mention my name. Okay. All right, so this is, think about it, this is another example of the 731 block design, which is called the Fano plane. But you know what? The first person to think of it up was Kirkman. Did he get credit? No. Life isn't fair. Mathematics, this happens a lot. People think of something, and they're the first ones, and it's named after somebody else. The life isn't there. Okay, Latin squares. Another origin of this idea. A Latin square is an array of numbers, the numbers from 1 to n, in an n by n array. Each number appears in each row and each column exactly once. Your Sudoku... Uh, that shows up in the, in the paper. Uh, Sudo a Sudoku array is a special case of a, uh, uh, a Latin square. And we can talk about orthogonality of two squares if the pairs, so like in A and B, if you look at uh, going across uh, the top row, we have 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4. Going across the second row, we have 2, 3, 1, 4, 4, 1, and 3, 2. And you keep on going, you realize for each of these pairs of uh, A, B, A, C, and B, C, that condition holds. 
So this is, these are three mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order four. Okay, and this is, Latin squares have been around for an awful long time, recreational mathematics again, and uh, then we come to this guy. This guy is one of the greatest mathematicians who <coughs> ever lived, as I mentioned already. He did many great things. Uh, he's everywhere in mathematics. He really is. Leonhard Euler. We had the uh, 300th anniversary of uh, his birth, and the MAA came out with a series of five really nifty books about his work and about him, and uh, he's just a great guy. Uh, your calculus book is effectively Euler's. And, you know, I mean, he didn't have all the graphics and fancy bells and whistles and computer applications and all that other stuff that makes the modern calculus book weigh 74 pounds and cost about $3,000. Uh, but you pare it down, you scrape out everything else, and what's left is Euler's differential and integral calculus textbooks from 1750s and 1760s. So what, what's happened? Nothing. Oh, well, it's not much. Now, what about what did Euler do? Well, when Euler was almost at the end of his life, he, he, made a, he made a conjecture about something that he called the problem of the 36 officers. You take 36 officers, six each from six different regiments, six each from six different ranks, into a six by six square in such a way that no rank or regiment will be repeated in any row or any column. Now, what he is asking for here is a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of order six. And he made this conjecture. And he said, no. Well, he said a whole lot more than that. He said, it can't be done. He says, in fact, for n bigger than or equal to two, there exists a pair of orthogonal Latin squares if and, or, if and only if n is not twice an odd number. That is, n is not even, but not divisible by 4. 2, 6, 10, 14, 18, and so forth. He said, none of those. And there's only one Latin square of size 2. Uh, you can't, you, if, uh, if you draw two of them, they're, they're really the same. You make a, 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 a change in one number. And, you draw two of them, they're not orthogonal. And in 1900, a guy named Terry proved Euler was right for six by, are you ready for this, exhaustive enumeration. <laughs> and he didn't even have computers. As a matter of fact, he didn't have computers, so he was forced to be clever. <laughs> he cut it down to only about 6,000 cases. Yeah, right. I think he was not easily bored. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, so Euler's orthogonal Latin squares conjecture. Well, guess what? We have Euler's conjecture demolished. In 1959, a man named Ernest T. Parker constructed a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of order 10. What's interesting to note is this is, a, this is an example where Euler was wrong for 10. The pair of orthogonal Latin squares appeared on the cover of a magazine called Scientific American, and inside was an article by Ivar about this singular event in the history of mathematics. That 175 years after Euler made a conjecture, Parker gave a counterexample, but it goes it's better than that. He and two colleagues, R.C. Bose and S.S. Shrikandi, proved that for every n bigger than 6, you can find a pair of orthogonal Latin squares of size n. Bose, incidentally, I have a nice picture of him. His papers from 1939, from 20 years earlier, uh, marked the foundation of modern combinatorial theory. He wrote two extensive papers uh, I think one of them was in the Annals of Eugenics or something like that. Uh, the name, uh, I can't remember. But anyway, 
uh, these two papers uh, spurred a great deal of interest in the subject of combinatorial design. And here's a picture of him. Uh, looks like a very nice man. I'm sorry I never met him. Uh, I don't have a picture of Parker. I don't have a picture of Shurkandi. Can't have everything. Uh, okay. Well, so, well, we have another name for 731. We've got a set of n minus 1 mutually orthogonal Latin squares of size n. We have a, a block design with those parameters. We have a projective plane with that many points on each line. And we have a, a different set with those parameters. And for n equals 2, I'll work this out, 4 plus 2 plus 1, 2 plus 1, 1, we get a 7, 3, 1 design. And now, for the first time on stage, the set of mutually orthogonal Latin squares of order 2, equivalent to the 731 block design and all those other guys. You ready for this? There it is. <laughs> it's the identity matrix. Because there aren't any two. It's the, it's the set of one orthogonal Latin square mod two. Okay. Well, that was fun. Let's see, what, else, what other mischief can we create? Ah! One of my favorite characters in mathematics. Percy J. Haywood uh, was uh, a mathematician living in England. And uh, when he was, uh, a few years before he was born, a man named Francis Guthrie, uh, who was a cousin of Augustus de Morgan, sent de Morgan a, uh, a letter saying, you know, I think that no matter what kind of map you can draw on a flat piece of paper, you can always use four colors to color the regions in such a way that... Uh, that regions that share a boundary edge will be colored different. So he sent it to his cousin De Morgan. De Morgan uh, mentioned this to Sir Arthur Cayley. Sir Arthur Cayley was president of the London Mathematical Society, and in 1878 he gave an address in which he mentioned this problem. The following year, a paper appeared uh, uh, about the map coloring problem by a man named A.B. Kemp, in which he purported to prove that four colors were sufficient. And uh, that paper reposed quietly in the literature for 11 years. And Percy J. came along and said, there might be truth to the statement that four colors suffice, but this proof is no proof. And he showed a very subtle error that Kemp made, then proceeded to prove the five color theorem. And for uh, about 86 years, there was a gap between 5 and 4. In order to, there was a, in the attempts to prove the four-color theorem, four-color conjecture, was, uh, were instrumental in starting and giving a, a big boost to the area of graph theory. So let's see what's going on with this. Uh, a proper coloring for a map, think of a map as just a bunch of countries drawn on some surface. And a proper coloring is an assignment of colors so that adjacent, not just sharing a corner but sharing an edge, neighboring countries that share an edge have different colors. And the chromatic number is the smallest number of colors you need. So, all right, I won't draw on the board. You can't see it anyway. Besides, there's no, uh, nothing to write with. Uh, you draw, in the plane, you can draw uh, three adjacent triangles. Watch. You can see this, right? right? There's a triangle here, a triangle here, and a triangle here, and the rest of the world outside. And all four of those are, yeah, thank you. Danny, Danny to the rescue. You want this one down here? No. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Let me add it. Oh, this is so cool. Uh, yeah. Can y'all see this? Who made these erasers? I hope you mentioned that I gave the chalk. All right. All right, here it is. Okay. One, two, three, four. The blackboard cannot be colored. This region, this, this, this 
decomposition of the blackboard can't be colored using fewer than four colors because each one of these four regions is adjacent to the other three. Isn't that cool? So now we prove that four colors are necessary. Now, as we know, being mathematicians, there's a difference between necessary and sufficient. We try to make our students understand this, and sometimes we're successful. I bet Alyssa's pretty successful most of the time. You have a hard time with that? No. Okay. Because if you knew, I want you to tell me how. Anyway. So the four color conjecture was this about proper coloring. It was finally proved in 1976 amongst the storm of controversy that it was you that the proof by Al Helen Hopkins used. Yes. What did it use? A computer. Ooh. Bad. Now nobody bats an eye. Computer aided proofs are all over the place. Of course, the question is. Program correct. Should you believe them? Yeah, well, should you believe them? Can we believe any of this stuff? But some people thought it was really great because there was a staff from the <coughs> University of Illinois that said four suffices, four yeah. colors suffice. Right, right, right. The stamp on the mail coming from the University of Illinois. <coughs> yeah. It was done on a computer known as the Iliac 4. Even the Iliac 4. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so but this is, this is uh, getting a little off the subject, but so what? We're... What about Haywood? Well, Haywood proved the five color theorem, but he said a whole lot more. He said, if you want to draw a map on the surface of a sphere with holes, like a donut with a whole lot of holes, G holes in particular, then the chromatic number for such maps is at most this number. The greatest integer in 7 plus 1 square root of 1 times 1 plus 48 g divided by 2. And for the one whole torus, this number is 7. Now, he would, did not prove this. He conjectured it. And it turned out it was finally proved in the 60s by a whole host of people, mainly Gerhard Ringel and J.W.T. Youngs. But he did prove it for g equals 1. Here's how he did it. Uh, he, he, he gave an example to prove that showed that 7 was necessary. And he had a pretty good uh, argument to show that 7 uh, would always do. And so here's what he did. Well, we've got to go back to the block design. What does that have to do with coloring? Watch. We have these, the 7 numbers, 1 through 7, and the 7 blocks. And we're going to form something called the incidence matrix. The incidence matrix is a matrix of zeros and ones where the rows represent blocks, the columns represent designs, and there's a one in each place where the relevant ob object variety is in the relevant block. Because if we look back at uh, block B, block B has one, four, and five, and you look here, and there we are. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna draw a graph. We're gonna draw a graph where the a graph being a set of points and lines. And the points are going to represent both the varieties, 1 through 7, and the blocks, A through G. So this is a 14-point graph, and we're going to join every pair of letter and number where there's a 1 in that picture. By the way, what's interesting about that uh, matrix? Hmm? Symmetric. It's symmetric, yeah. If you flip it on its main diagonal, you get the same thing. Isn't that cool? Symmetric matrices are wonderful. Okay, so what does this thing look like? Well, it's called a block point graph. And I took the liberty of working all of that out. And it looks kind of... Oops. This is known as the Hewitt graph. He drew this graph. And now, you can't draw this in the plane. You've got too many lines crossing. And you can pull the, le the line from 3 to the, the edge joining 3 and A and curve it around. That cuts. And you can do that, but you can't draw this in the plane without at least three crossings. And he would say, hey, I can do something else. Here's what he did. He drew it on the surface of a donut. Now, what you have to imagine is that the top edge, so we've got this flat piece of paper on the top edge, and the bottom edge are going to curl around, and they're going to meet that top line, 3F3 up there, and down here we got 3F3. We meet those together. 
And now, so it's kind of curved around like a mailing tube. And now we're going to curve the tube around and join the two ends, uh, matching up uh, the three up there, uh, matching up uh, this point with the point over there next to V and the G over to G, and we get a donut. We can think of, uh, so now what we have is seven regions, which I've numbered using the Roman numerals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this is drawn on the surface of a donut, and each of those regions is surrounded by six others. If you'll notice, uh, look at the region 1. To the north of 1, we have 4. To the south, we have 5. To the northeast, we have 2. To the northwest, we have 3. To the southeast, we have 6. To the southwest, we have 7. You can't do that in the plane, but you can do that on the surface of the donut. So they're all hexagons. They're hexagons. There's seven mutually adjacent hexagons on the surface of a donut. And what this proves is that every single one of those regions being adjacent, it's kind of like this, only on a torus. One whole donut. So seven colors are certainly necessary. And so that was Hewood's uh, example that showed that seven was necessary. He also provided a proof that seven su were sufficient. Okay. So, so these are the names we got so far. Symmetric balanced incomplete block design. As Kipling said in one of his stories, aren't those beautiful words? Oh, best beloved. A perfect different set of finite projective plane, a complete set of orthogonal Latin squares. That he would graph in seven mutually adjacent hexagons on a, on a torus. That's six of them. And because it's seven, three, one, it would be nice to have seven names. Enter Richard Hamming. Richard Hamming uh, was uh, one of the uh, fathers of modern computing. He was working in Bell Labs after the Second World War. And uh, there was a, he got into a disagreement with a machine. Or he got mad at it. This machine was known as the Model 6 Relay Computer. Any of you all ever seen a relay computer? Well, we got solid state and we're growing chips and this, that, and the other now. A relay computer, before there was chips, there was integrated circuits, and before there was integrated circuits, there was transistors, and before there was transistors, there was vacuum tubes, and before there was vacuum tubes, there was electromechanical relays. These were very cantankerous machines. You would feed in the data and the program on a piece of tape, and there was a little reader, and sometimes it didn't read or there was an error in reading. And there were two possible outcomes of that. If this was during business hours, there was an operator that would stop the machine, reload your job, and start it again. If it was after hours on the weekend and it did that, the machine would automatically dump, them, dump, dump the job and go on to the next one. Now, Hamming was only allowed to use this on weekends. <laughs> Uh, you see what's coming. Yeah. By the way, the, the account of this is written in a fascinating book called From Error Correcting Codes to Spear Packing to Finite Simple Groups. Uh, one of the Keras monographs by a man named Thompson and won the uh, Beckenbach Award. It's a wonderful book. Uh, go out and buy it. Buy five copies. Give you yeah. <laughs> So what happened? So two weekends in a row, the story goes. Uh, Hang loads his job on Friday, goes home, comes back on Monday, on the floor. Does it again the next weekend. Loads the job on Friday, goes home, come back on Monday, it's on the floor. And he gets mad. And you can't get mad at a machine. Well, you can, but the trouble is it doesn't flinch at you or get mad back or offer excuses or anything like that, like your kids. Uh, <laughs> So he went to his boss. I can imagine the scenario. So he goes into his boss and he says, This is an apple pated around a friend of the machine. Like, Richard, you're a smart man. You figure it out. Now go away and don't bother me. Slams the door in his face. So what would you do? So he reasoned, Ah, oh, if a computer, if a machine can recognize a mistake, 
it is certainly possible that we could figure out a way for that machine to correct the mistake. It knows where the mistake is. Aha, there's the mistake. With that was born the theory of error correcting codes. The first practical error correcting code was invented by Hamming because he got mad at a machine. They're everywhere. They're in all CDs and DVDs and their applications of these through helping safeguard networks and uh, communication channels against accidental interference. It just, they're everywhere. Well, let's look at what uh, uh, we have here. According to Claude Shannon, this is in his paper, one of his papers on information theory, you have a string of bits, 1 through 7, x1 through x7, these are zeros and ones, and 3, 5, 6, and 7 are message symbols chosen arbitrarily by the user. And the other three are redundant, and they're calculated in this way. And uh, when a block of 7 is received, you calculate those sums, which amounts, by the way, to matrix multiplication by a certain very nice 3 by 7. Uh, and if the sum is even, you call it zero, you calculate it mod two. The binary number alpha, beta, gamma, believe it or not, gives the subscript of the wrong bit. And if it's zero, there wasn't any error. This is under the assumption that most one error was made. Isn't that fantastic? Could you have thought that up? No, I couldn't have either. Not on the best day of my life. <laughs> Not even today, which is one of them. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what he did. So we have the message words. Right? Zero, 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 zero down to one, 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 one. Uh, Richard, are you trying to tell me something? Okay. All right. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to arrange x1 to make the sum of the odd positions. <laughs> right. Yeah. You hear or? You hear Well, look, yeah. If you look, you can see that, the, the, that in each row, the sum of the ones, they're either zero ones, two ones, or four ones. Well, let's do the same thing with x2. You choose x2 to make the x2 plus x3 plus x6 plus x7 uh, even. And so we either have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 0 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 4 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 2 ones, 4 ones. And the same thing with the last four bits. Make that even. And if you do that, and then what you send, if you want to send the, uh, the word, the, the message word, 0110, which is this guy here, you send this string, 1100110110. And the de the, this is real-time decoding, because the machine actually reads in, does the com computation, mm -hmm. multiplication of uh, strings of bits, calculates is there an error? Yes. Changes the error, sends it on, and goes on to the next message. And it's done very quickly. Uh, and this was incorporated into the entire Bell system of telephone switches. Why are we talking about hand and code? It's about 731. Guess what? If you look at the code words of weight, Three. That is, the code words with seven one with three ones in them. There are seven of them. Guess what? The positions of the ones. Look at them. It's a miracle. <laughs> no, it isn't. Well, maybe it is. One more time. One more time. Cool. 7, 3, so now, well, before I do that, 
So this block design, again, we'll go back and forth so you can see. The rows of weight three, those seven rows constitute uh, with the position, the relative positions, constitute the 731 block design. Oh, now, there are some more names of 731. But before we do that, I want to offer a challenge. Okay? I want you to construct the 731. Can you construct a 731 block design with letters of the English alphabet? John, can you do that? <laughs> what do you do with, let's see. A, you can say A is 1, B is 2, uh, C is 3, D is 4, and all that. We could construct one like that. A, B, C, A, D, E, A, E, F, and all that. We can do that. Okay. Right. But each block is a three-letter <laughs> <laughs> Now, if the block is something like, say, A, W, R, that can be the word war or the word raw. Uh, you don't worry about the order of the letters. They're just supposed to be there. Uh, <laughs> you know what's coming? Anybody guess? Well, that's right. I mean, you, so you have a seven three one block design, which means each pair of letters is only in one word, and uh, seven words form an English sentence. On top of all of that, it's a grammatically correct <laughs> English sentence. Anybody can form an English sentence. Well, if you figure it out, send me an email. Or write it as the click and clack say on the back of a $5,000 bill and mail it to me. And uh, I'll pretend I never said this. No. All right, I'll give you a, I'll, I, will, I will tell you the following true fact, it can be done. An even truer fact is I have done it. An even truer fact is I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you got to figure it out for yourself. It's just the fun of doing it. There's even more than one solution. So, here are the seven names of 731. There they are. But you know what? Seven more. 731 appears in round robin tournaments of certain types. Round robin tournament where everybody plays everybody else exactly once. There are no ties. A kind of a matrix called a skew Hadamard matrix. An example of a skew Hadamard matrix will back up a bit. Uh, we're going to back up quite a bit. There. Take that 7x7 seven seven matrix, border it on uh, the right and on the bottom with 1's, and put a 1 down in the lower end, change all the zeros to minus 1's, you have an example of a Hadamard matrix, which is a matrix of size n whose product with its transpose gives you the identity the identity matrix except there are n's down the diagonal instead of 1's. And it turns out a particular kind of one of these matrices called a skew Hadamard matrix is another name of 731. Oh, yeah. There's a number field, a place where you can solve certain kinds of equations. This is a little more exotic. Uh, it shows up there. It, there's a, you can make a field, now, there's an eight element field that you can construct in a certain way, and the addition table is effectively uh, the 731 block design mangled in a little funny way. Uh, you know about that? Yeah, that's you would. There's something called the Octonians. You know about the Octonians? Anybody know about the Octonians? The Octonians are just strange eight-dimensional, think of it as ordered, uh, ordered octuples of real numbers that can be multiplied in a really weird way. Now, uh, the quaternions are a bunch of four-tuples that can be multiplied. The multiplication is not commutative. That is, A times B is not always B times A. 
Well, the octonians are even worse. It's not commutative and it's not associative. Uh, and beyond that, nothing works. And it's multiplication table for the units. There's, there's seven units and one. And that multiplication table is determined by, yeah, that's right, seven through one block design. The uh, simple group of order 168, whatever that is, uh, uh, the collection of mappings of the numbers 1 through 7 to itself that preserve the blocks in that block design. Turns out there are 168 of those. Not only that, this strange object, this simple group, contains a copy of 731 inside of it, which is one of the fascinating things you find out when you teach algebra out of a book by a couple of guys named Dummett and Foote. They actually have the example in there. That's wonderful. Uh, a solution is something called a seven hands problem. I'm going to let you go and Google a seven hands problem. So that's 14 names of 73 hands. It would be nice to have three times seven names. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the elementary two group. Uh, think of ordered, ordered triples, zeros, and ones. You add by uh, coordinate wise, and one and one is zero. Uh, something called the F7 matroid, which one of you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, matroid is a wonderful kind of a gadget. Uh, I'm going to read a paper that appeared in, I think, Math Magazine by Nancy Neudauer and one of her colleagues about these things, and she talks about that. Uh, Number 17, a quantum controlled two junction not gate. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> but I was looking around for the 21st, and there it is. It's something associated with quantum groups, with quantum computing, and it's, I don't know what it is. A beautiful curve called Klein's quartic curve shows, and 731 shows up in it. And a strange kind of a coloring of graphs called list coloring. And uh, the unique non-three choosable list coloring of K77, uh, imagine if I had seven fingers <coughs> and you draw a line between each of the seven fingers on this side and each of the seven fingers on that side. And uh, if you assign the colors uh, to each vertex on this side, the blocks of the 731 block design and the ones on this side, then that's what's that's called it's not three choosable, whatever that means. I don't want to go into it. Uh, that's another dissertation. Uh, something called a characteristic two division ring, which I don't want to go into. And remarkably, uh, Leach's eight dimensional minimal sphere packing lines, which shows up in this other book. This book, yeah, sphere packing lines. Seven times three, 21 names, and there are more. But I won't bore you with them. I'll bore you with something else. <laughs> so what did we find, what did we learn from all of this? Good things can emerge. I don't think they always emerge, but they can emerge from getting mad at a computer. If you know what to do. The point is not to get mad at the computer, but to fool the computer. If you're doing your work for you, you teach the computer. Okay, what else? Even mathematical science occasionally <laughs> guess wrong. Mm-hmm, right, yeah, oil. A giant, a veritable giant of giants. Guess wrong. Who do thunk it? Well, well, uh, sometimes solving old problems <laughs> takes a long time. <laughs> you know about that. The uh, four-color conjecture was proposed, formulated in 1852 and not solved until 1976. Haywood's conjecture from 1890 to 1968. Euler's uh, wrong guess from 1782 to 1959. And then there was some remark that a guy, in, wasn't he Fairmont? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> margin of a book in 1637 that uh, was not solved completely and published until 1995. So, the moral of that is be patient. <laughs> it's free math and math. Incredible, of course. Look at all the stuff we're going to be talking about here. And, like Euler, 